Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the channel. And it's funny because we've, we've been in the chat for the last 15, 20 minutes, just as I was prepping for the show. And we were talking about cake donuts and all kinds of other foods that are shaped like rings. And we're going to be talking about rings today, specifically the rings around the tree stump that was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We're going to talk about what these rings really mean because Rings symbolize rulership, and this is why when kings wore crowns, they were in the shape of a ring. Now, the rings bind these kings and their sphere of influence and power under the Most High. And that is really the true symbolism of the ring. Now, of course, the enemy has his dark side versions of the ring, the black hole sun, you know, coronal rings that they worship. But also, the rings have significance in the Bible. It is the boundary by which we are held in this reality. Now, today, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I was doing, um, I was basically looking at this dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to reimagine this dream through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And this dream was about a tree and Daniel had decrypted this tree and the tree appeared in a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. So we're going to go get into Daniel chapter four. Let me pull that up here as I'm talking about it. And the story picks up in Daniel four, verse 10. Now I believe that what the word is telling us here is that the tree symbolized a portal to heaven, the conduit through which God has ultimate control in this in this plane, in this place. And I'm believing that what is really being described when a tree is being signified is really an invisible magnetic field portal. Now, why do I say that? Well, trees look like magnetic fields. We've been talking about this for a very long time. The visual similarity of the magnetic field. It's called a toroidal field. But when you look at it and you really think about the basic shape of a toroidal field, a magnetic field, it has a top or a crown and it has roots that go down and it's narrow in the middle. It's the basic shape of a tree. Fruit also follows this basic shape, this toroidal field. All fruits do. They have a core that's narrow in the middle and they fan up and around with the crown and down below with the roots and coming back and connecting to one another. Now, this is a basic concept and this has been known for some time. I didn't discover this, but what people had failed to do was to compare all these different parts of our reality and objects in our reality and nature and see that they were all similar, this similar basic shape. And this is why they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, because they're basically mirror images of one another, this toroidal field. In fact, it seems to represent some kind of boundary, the boundary of our reality, things manifesting in these shapes. Now, I'm beginning to believe that this tree that's described in Daniel 10 is some kind of invisible magnetic tree portal. Now, during this dream, Nebuchadnezzar says that a watcher came down. Now, watchers are from heaven, obviously. And this suggests that the tree was a portal through which angels could travel. Now, there are other examples of this. Angels coming down to these high mountains. What is a high mountain? What is the basic shape of a high mountain? It is the bottom half or the bottom portion of the toroidal field shape, isn't it? It's the tree trunk. And if you were to flip that mountain and mirror it up into the heavens, you would see the crown of the tree. Now, this isn't rocket science. These are simple observations. Just simply contemplating these basic shapes and ideas and concepts that no one's really taken the time to do before. Now, we're going to get into this passage. I've got it on the screen here. And this is the basic story in the Bible 
of this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Let's read a little bit of this. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. This was just after the, uh, the this tree is described in verse 10. Visions of mine in my bed and my head I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. That's the middle of the earth. Now think about this for a second, because um, a magnetic field of the earth the core of that magnetic field, the middle part of the toroid, would be in the middle of the earth, right? And so this represented the sphere of influence, the sphere of power under heaven, under God, of Nebuchadnezzar the king. He had full control of the world, sphere of power, his invisible tree, you could call it. And the Bible says here that the tree grew and was strong and the height reached unto heaven in the sight of therefore or the sight thereof to the end of all of the earth. So it encompassed the entire earth. So nothing that we have said so far is contradicted by the word. Let's keep reading. The leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much and in it meat for all. So this fed the entire earth. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the in the boughs thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. The entire world was under this tree, this, the influence of this tree. Now, then the watcher came down and said, Cut down the tree, cut off the branches, shake off the leaves, and scatter the fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Now, understand that great men of the Bible have been compared to trees in many other parts of the Bible. Ezekiel 31 talks about a Pharaoh who was compared to a giant tree as well. I think I have that pulled up here. And this particular Pharaoh compared to the... Uh, to this giant tree also had limbs that spread out across the entire world. Just like Nebuchadnezzar's tree it says here, all the birds of the air nested in its boughs. All the beasts of the field gave birth under its branches. All the great nations lived in its shade. Are you starting to figure it out now? The word is amazing. It's a living, breathing document also in isaiah 10 33 it says behold the lord god of hosts will lop off the branches with terrifying power the tall trees will be cut down the lofty ones will be felled he will clear the forest thickets with an axe and lebanon will fall before the mighty one so we have precedent in the bible of people being compared to trees even in the New Testament, Jesus healed a man's eyesight who was blind. And when talked to, the man said that the people appeared as trees. So, the trees seem to symbolize our spiritual or physical field of influence. It's, a, it's an invisible tree. And through our sphere, through our little tree, we're, we're either connected with the Holy Spirit and in God's will, connected up to heaven through the core or we're connected to the dark side below and manipulated by the devil. So it appears as though the cutting of this tree that's talked about here in Daniel signifies the severing of the portal to heaven or the severing of the graces of God and his ability to work through you. Let's keep reading here. Because after the tree was cut down, it says, Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And so at this point, the connection is severed. And in verse 22, it talks about his power reached into heaven. 
Now, this confirms what we're saying about this sphere of influence or sphere of power. Let's jump down here. It thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Let's go back here because there's more to this. Now, if you're looking at this Bible that I'm using, it's called the QBible.com. And this is a basically a concordance. It's actually several concordances. So what you do is you see these little, these are the actual concordance numbers. When you click on these numbers, it takes you to another screen that allows you to look at the different concordances and the meanings of this word. So for instance, the words, nevertheless, you go on here, you click on it, and it will tell you how that word is used in every other single part of the Bible. Now, this only covers the Old Testament. And so when I, anytime I go to the Old Testament, I always pull this up because you can't really rely on the translations because different translations hide things. They hide it intentionally to confuse you, to get you to doubt God, to get you to in subjection to governments. So always come to this. These, you know, if you have a question about a passage and the passage seems like it's contradicting some other part of the Bible, you just come here, you do your research and you'll see, you'll see that there is no contradiction. But you got to go into the concordance. So let's get back into this now. So we have something happening here we we it, we begin to see here that this severing of the connection to god is really the severing of his grace and holy spirit okay poured out what do you pour something out through you pour it through a funnel which looks exactly like the middle of a magnetic field it's like a funnel and once his grace and spirit are removed we are brought low aren't we just like the beasts of the field, which is exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, so far, you've probably heard some new information with what I'm talking about here, but to drive the point home, we're going to break it down even further. And this is when it's all going to make sense to you. What, th what this really symbolizes on a deeper level. And it's been left for us to unlock in the last days. The Bible promises that the knowledge would increase in the last days. So at this point, Nebuchadnezzar uh, has been shut off. God basically closed this portal when he severed the tree. And then it says here, but they put these bands of iron and copper. Now it says brass here, but here again, the concordance. You, you hover above the word brass and it says copper. Okay, so really it's copper. Now, brass is copper. Brass is, I believe, 88% copper, to be exact. So it's mostly copper with some alloys in it for strength because copper is a very soft metal. We're going to talk about what these rings or these bands really mean because this goes very, very deep. So before we talk about the bands or the rings that were wrapped around the stump of this tree... It says here in the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. So what is this dew all about that was left on the stump and on the beasts? I'm thinking the dew is the remnant left behind of the connection that once was. It's a sort of a promise of restoration, kind of like the life-giving waters that Jesus spoke about. Because Ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar was given a second chance. As we'll read in a minute here, he only had to eat grass in the field for seven times, which most people believe means seven years. Then he was restored to his kingship. So maybe this dew represented just the remnant left behind that there was hope that he would be restored. Because it says here, let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over so he got turned into a beast instead of a man so the tree was cut it was bound with iron and copper so nebuchadnezzar went from the lord of the rings to the slave of the rings didn't he 
Because rings, as we open the show with, represent rulership. Rulership over what? Well, iron is iron-based blood and copper is copper-based blood. The two bloodlines, going back to the beginning prophecy of the Bible, the enmity between the two seeds talked about in Genesis. Rings represent rulership. So just like in Lord of the Rings, they talk about one ring to rule them all. Well, these rings represented the rulership over the two bloodlines, iron-based blood versus copper-based blood. Now, at this point, the word says that Nebuchadnezzar was basically turned into a bird. Let's read. This matter by decree of the watchers and the demand by the word to the holy ones, the intent that the living may know that it says here, let's see what this word is translated to. Supreme God ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream King Nebuchadnezzar had seen, now thou, O Belshazzar, declare, which was Daniel, his name was renamed Belshazzar, the inter interpretation thereof for as much as all the wise men of the kingdom are not able to make known unto him the interpretation. Let's get down to the part to see what exactly happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. So, because it repeats itself a little bit in the word here. So, it will make it shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and they shall be wet with thee with the dew of heaven. And I think it might even go into the next chapter here about his appearance and what Nebuchadnezzar looked like. He basically was turned into an eagle. He had feathers. It says here, his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. So what is the meaning of that. Now, Daniel doesn't tell us. So nothing I've said here is in contradiction to what Daniel said, because Daniel only really talks about, uh, you know, certain parts of the interpretation of this. He doesn't really say what the tree means. He doesn't say what it means that Nebuchadnezzar was turned into an eagle. But here's what the Holy Spirit impressed upon me as to what it means. What it seems and appears to be is that Nebuchadnezzar was transformed into a lowly former inhabitant of the tree, like a bird, right? He was cast to the ground out of his nest. He was turned into a flightless eagle, complete with these eagle feathers and talons. And he was forced to eat grass instead of what a, an eagle would normally eat. So you can almost look at Nebuchadnezzar as a bird that fell from his nest. He was a fallen eagle. But then after that, after seven years or seven times, Nebuchadnezzar was restored. Just as the dream foretold, he was restored. And But here's what happened. After his kingdom was restored, it didn't take long for him to get right back into his unfaithfulness. He started worshiping iron and brass gods, as well as wood and gold and silver. Now, why would he do this? Instead of realizing that the Most High was the one who made the gold and silver and the wood and the copper, Nebuchadnezzar once again started worshiping them instead of him. Now, here's where we get into the nested reality. Because birds live in nests, don't they? That's your first clue. And everything in our reality are things within things. So think about this for a second. The very basic representation. Now, this is going to blow your mind. 
because now you're when I explain this to you, you're going to see how it even fits into this prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar. The most basic interpretation, the first fruits in our reality are babies in the womb and fruit in the trees, right? And both follow the same basic shape. A child in the womb has an umbilical cord. That is the narrow gate. This is why God says, I knew you in the womb. The first fruits are the closest that anything gets to God because it comes right out of God's spiritual realm into our physical realm. And this is why you see children saying certain things that just are amazing out of the mouth of babes because they were the last thing that they saw was knowing God in the womb. Now they have forgotten, but this is what we see. And this is why these first fruits are so important to God. Even in the Old Testament, God had the first fruits. He was given the first fruits as the perfect form of worship to him in atonement for our sins. Now think about this for a second. So you have a fruit, you have an apple, which is the first fruit from the tree. And then your little apple or your little person grows up and has their own tree, invisible magnetic field, their sphere of influence. Is it good? Is their fruit good? Or is it bad? What kind? What are the things that they're doing in this life? Are they sinning? And is their fruit dark and rotten? Or is their fruit good? Reaching to the heavens spiritually. The least of us will be the greatest and the greatest will be the least, it says in the Bible. So think about it. That child was inside of its mother. That's a nested reality. So it was a tree within a tree. Right? And then imagine now bigger trees. These kings of the earth. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, his tree reached to the heavens. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was not a good man. We're going to talk about that. But he was living in the will of God to carry out a purpose. He was used as a tool. And the Bible describes him as a servant of God, but not a good servant. His job was to exact judgment on God's people, the people of Judah, because they were worshiping false gods, just like Nebuchadnezzar was. Now, let's go back to the actual fruit that falls from trees. That fruit, what does it do? It creates more trees, more magnetic field shapes through its seed. And this is why you hear the seed talked about so many times in the Bible, because this is the basic concept of our entire reality, or at least trees. Everything and all the words and verbiage describing all these spiritual things that happen in the Bible all center around trees. Water, the Holy Spirit... Uh, the, the living waters, the wells, all of this stuff goes back to this basic concept of a tree. And this is why the trees of the garden was the beginnings of our reality. Now, let's fast forward to, or rewind to Nebuchadnezzar. And he was his tree was rotten. His fruit was rotten because of his pride. And God brought him down low. And instead of recognizing the big tree, the tree from the forest, he went right back to worshiping the things that were created by God instead of worshiping the Most High himself. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar was stuck in a nest and he couldn't look to the outer layers of the nest and understand the full and true meaning of his mistake. He went right back to worshiping the false gods of iron Brass, copper, wood, gold, and silver. Now, hopefully this is all starting to make sense to you because we just went from the physical to the spiritual in that discussion. Now, how did God use Nebuchadnezzar? Well, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the kingdom of Judah. Here's the story here in Wikipedia. Let's go back up to the top. Here's the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the second but it's the same one. And God used him to destroy Jerusalem, which led to the Babylonian captivity as the city's population and the people from 
the surrounding lands were deported to Babylonia. So this was the Babylonian exile that Jesus spoke about in the New Testament when he was recounting his ancestry, when he was talking about the 14, 14, and 14 generations. Remember, he said there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, uh, 14 generations from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 generations from the exile in Babylon to the birth of Jesus. So that's 42 total generations. Now, we had done a video about this ancestry. We mapped it, on a, mapped it out on a world timeline. And what we found was that the entire history of the Bible followed a rainbow pattern. And each segment of history represented a color in the rainbow. Now, if I, I'm trying to do this from memory, but basically uh, started out with red. Then I think it went to yellow, then to green, then to blue, then to purple. The, the exact order of the rainbow colors. And in the very middle of the rainbow, you have the birth of Christ. He was in the middle, the midst of the garden, the midst of world history. Or somewhere in there. I'll have to look back. I don't want to misspeak here, but maybe what I'll do is I'll pin that particular rainbow video in the pinned comments so you guys can look at that because it will help you to make sense of this world timeline and how all this works. Okay. Now, let's keep going here because in here it talks about the book of Jeremiah and, it, and that actually paints Nebuchadnezzar as a cruel enemy but also God's appointed ruler of the world and the divine instrument to punish disobedience. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's attack on the kingdom of Judah was justified in the book of Jeremiah on account of its populace's disobedience of God. So God does appoint kings even when they are wicked. And it's judgment basically to teach us a lesson, just as he did with Judah. Now, understand, this isn't what people who support Thump mean when they say that he's appointed by God. They're not saying that to understand that this could be judgment and then he is not a, a righteous man. He's a wicked man. The, the people that support Thump do so because they actually worship him as righteous. But remember, Nebuchadnezzar was far from righteous. He was used as a tool. Basically, God brought him to his knees, didn't give him a choice. Because God was using him as a tool. So, let's summarize this as I go back into the chat. And let's see if you guys have any questions about this. As the chat catches up here. So, what is the root meaning of the tree? Well, I believe that it signifies the invisible connection to heaven. And where it meets the sphere of influence of our magnetic field. Our spiritual field. And basically, when you look at the pronounced and exaggerated tree-shaped magnetic field of these powerful men that this field pressed against heaven, they were basically trying to usurp power from the Most High. And this is why God had to bring them back low again. I don't know what the significance of the number seven means. We do know that the number seven represents like kingship or rulership. Some people believe it represents... Uh, Jesus, but in this case, it probably represents rulership, okay? Notice how these things are multiples of seven. The 14 generations, multiples of seven. All this means something. Now, the symbolism of the tree at its root meaning is a throwback by God of his great tree worlds from the Garden of Eden. And that he made these worlds and limits the power of the habit of the inhabitants that live within them. So imagine Adam and Eve once had access to many trees of the garden or many frames of reality. They were told not to come into this tree and eat of the fruit. This is the tree we're stuck in, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
in the set of rules. Okay, and where was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was in, was it in the midst of the garden? In the middle? I believe it may have been. So what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He was transformed into a lowly inhabitant that once lived in this tree. He was cast to the ground, turned into a flightless eagle, forced to eat grass. Interesting, right? All right, so, you know, crazy, right? Crazy, crazy. So I was glad we got to get through that. Let's go into the chat here, see what you guys are up to. Seven is completion. Thanks, uh, Stacy. William just made it. Glad you could join us, William. Heard the dogwood tree was cursed because Yeshua was hung on a dogwood. Was cursed to grow crooked. Hmm. Okay. I'm just reading through your comments here. How do you hear from the Holy Spirit, says Eric? Well, it's a walk, as Jesus describes. You know, you walk with him. You shed away all the things he tells you to shed away. You know, I used to put a very high importance on, you know, my status in life. I didn't think I did back then. But... I did, you know, and a lot of it was pressure from the outside. You know, the world tells you that to be a man, you have to make a lot of money and, you know, have children and just try to keep stepping up in the world. You know, yeah, they, the world tells you to, that there's this uh, course that you're supposed to take, right? And in that course, that's the worldly course. And when you go on that course, it almost severs your connection to God. Now, God's still there. He's still trying to work in your life to bring you back to him. But it's very hard for him to do when we're on the devil's course. So, you know, I looked at my life back then in the late 90s and 2000s when I was raising my children and married. I looked at my life then as successful. You know, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, which... All my friends envied the job that I had because I, you know, I only worked probably 20 hours a week. I had a company car, full benefits, and I was making six figures. And my former wife was able to stay home. Now we were on a budget, but, you know, we owned a home in California, owned two homes in California. So we were doing really well. And but then I began to see that no matter how well you did, the people around you started expecting you to do even more. The, the race never ends. And at any given point, the devil could sweep, swipe in and take it all away. So through the course of some heartache and pain, God basically made me low, just like he did Nebuchadnezzar. He pulled it all out from under me. And that was, at that point, that was the divorce and... You know, I pretty much lost uh, custody of my children because that's what they do in California. They give the mother 80% and the, and the father 20. You're, you become an uh, every other weekend dad, which is devastating to a father who was involved in their children's lives, you know, up to that point. So I lost it all. I lost the reason why I felt like I was doing what I was trying to do to be successful. And I had no purpose. That's when God had me. He knew I had one choice. I didn't want to live at that point because I figured, what's this all for? I just go to work. I give away 70% of my income to the ex-wife. I have no money to even entertain my own children when they come with me every other weekend. And we just rebuilt from the bottom up. Went on bike rides and played tennis, did a lot of that watched a few videos, but it's nothing the same as the family life that you have. Now, I wasn't an angel during my marriage. And I, you know, I can sit here and blame the other person and say it's all their fault. But I made mistakes too because I was figuring it out. I was going on a path. So, at the end of the day, 
uh, I had to start over. I had to figure out what this life meant. And I was asking a lot of really tough questions. I was deep in prayer asking God, why does this happen? Why is the world so unfair? How does a judge tell me I can only see my children 20% of the time when I was the whole reason why they were safe? Their mother was able to stay home with them. They were nurtured. I didn't understand. And I was very angry for many, many years because of that. Why do they get to take away 80, 70% of my income and I can't even pay my bills? I didn't understand. But God wanted me to know that you have to walk away, be willing to walk away from it all to do his will. Now, his will in my life has become this YouTube channel. And you notice we have not faltered in the past 10 years. And you see how the devil has tried to minimize that impact with the very, very slow growth of this channel. Everybody knows it, right? 10 years we've been on YouTube uploading these kinds of videos pretty much every single day. You see other channels growing leaps and bounds. That was God continuing to humble me, okay? Because maybe I'd be a different person if I was one of those 500,000 subscriber YouTube channels, right? God's still working with me. And this is how he works. He brings you low. He says, okay, are you willing to get up every day and serve me even though I'm suppressing your channel and I've got you pretty much at the bottom of your peers? And yes, he did. And he knows. And so every day I wake up, I'm serving him. Now, there are people, some people don't understand this walk, you know, they don't understand what's going on here. But trust me, God has had me at the edge and in full faith, complete faith in his will in my life, because nothing is for sure. Okay. Nothing is for sure. But he keeps me in this space because he knows this is how I operate the best and how I serve him the best. He can't give me too many blessings. He gives me a lot of blessings, but he can't give me too many blessings. So, because he wants to make sure that I stay humble, right? Now, the biggest lesson in humility that I think I've experienced was this walk here on YouTube, being at the edge of having channels deleted at the bottom of the group, watching all my peers thrive, and me being here with not as much influence as them with very, very important information that should be getting out to the world, right? So a lesson in humility, and that should be a lesson to all of us, okay? What's at the heart of why you do what you do? Is it for yourself or is it to serve the most high? And every day I get to wake up and see the blessings of all of you coming here, and seeing how everybody is blessed to be here and inspired. Anytime I'm feeling down, I just go into the comments section. I see all of the support and love. I see all the discussions that you guys talk about. And all of the encouragement that you give to each other. And I can only imagine that that pleases God. So to answer your question, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? You do what Jesus said. You lay it all down. I walked away from a six-figure career. And I walked away from um, basically, how do I put this? I had to accept that I didn't have my children the way I wanted to. I had to walk away from that. And I had to go on God's walk. I had to go on God's walk. I had to let go of the anger of being broke for basically 10 years. While, you know, I made sure that they grew up and got their child support and everything. Well, you know, the government doesn't give you an option, but. And so, yeah, this number's wrong. For some reason, YouTube has been doing this lately. Messing with these, the number of viewers here. But don't worry, you guys are still here because I see the chat going by. So that means we're still here. It's just something going on with YouTube, some glitch. And so. I lived in that space for the last 10 years, basically, in poverty and waking up every day and making sure that I was doing right by God's will. Now, I'm not a perfect human being. I've made mistakes over those years, but I always try to do God's will and he works with me through the sin in my life and things that I still need to work on. 
So early on in this process of having this YouTube channel, uh, the Holy Spirit was very, very strong because I needed that at that time because I was in a bad way. I was just, and you guys have seen it. You've seen the progression of some of my earliest videos back in 2012. I was somewhat immature and maybe put too much emphasis on wanting to be recognized. And now we've grown and matured and God has blessed us. And I've fixed certain things in my life through his will and grace. And so at a certain point, so here's usually how it happens or here's how it happened for me with the Holy Spirit and God's will in my life. It came on very strong in the beginning because God was very grateful that I wanted to live in his will and willing to let it all go. He worked with me on the things I was still holding on to. And then it's like when you first pour a pitcher of water, it comes out really fast at the beginning and then it's it just keeps a steady flow. And so God has helped me be very efficient and good at decoding things and showing you the true spiritual meaning behind our reality. And so he wants you to see these things. He wants you to see these things so that you can understand that the reality that you live in, this tree that we're living in, is a dark tree. And the only way out of it, the only way to reconnect is through his son that will bring us back to him. Now, if you have doubts about the one and only true God and his son, think about what we just talked about today, this magnetic tree, and think about how that was basically described in the Bible, a document thousands of years old, was describing physical properties of our reality that absolutely nobody knew about when the book of Genesis was written. And understand that only the true Most High God could have written that down in pages and impressed that upon his prophets and the authors of the Bible. And to him goes all the glory because he's the only one that could have known those physical properties. Now, people want to argue and say, oh, you know, the Egyptians knew so much. The Egyptians are copycats. They're copycats. And this is why science wants to say and archaeologists want to say that the Egyptians predated everything. They don't have any proof of it. You can't, you know, carbon date rocks. But yet they try to get the, the Egyptians to predate everything. Earliest civilization, right? One of the earlier civilizations. They do. The devil does that on purpose to try to discredit the Bible and the wonders of the Bible. The wonders of the Bible being some of these descriptions in the word, hidden until our day, these scientific and physical descriptions of things that were not known or not supposed to be known back then, our physical magnetic field, our tree shape. So, very interesting. So there's a little bit of a testimony of my life. Many of you have heard that story before, but in order to receive the Holy Spirit, you start with baby steps. Sometimes you're going to go through a lot of pain in the beginning to make the change, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, just like I did to make the change. Sometimes you'll go into the wilderness. My wilderness journey was when I was in France, all by myself, me, myself, and I, walking with God every day. You wake up, there are no people around to greet you. You wake up, you're by yourself, and it's you and God. A lot of talking going on with you and God. And he, he strengthens you. And there will be hard times. Nothing will be perfect. But he will always give you something to eat and some shelter. That's what he promises. Us. Just like the birds of the field and all of creation has shelter and things to eat. And that's all you really need. So... That's how I received the Holy Spirit. And it's a daily walk. You have to check yourself. You have to check your ego at the door. You know, God puts us here to serve others. Okay. 
And sometimes it feels like, you know, maybe you feel like sometimes you want to be served, but that's not the good, that's not the way to go. You have to serve others and it's, it's hard to do sometimes, but we're here to care for the infirm and help others. That's what we're here to do. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. And it starts with the people in your life. And if you can't serve the people in your life, then you're no good to God. Because you may be the person that he that sent that he sent to that person to care for them. And these are this is when you get into when Jesus returns and he says, I never knew you. Because if he sent you to someone to be that person in their life and you weren't doing it, then he's going to say, I never knew you. He's going to say, I gave you a project. I gave you. You didn't even have to look. You didn't even have to go out onto the street and find a homeless person. I gave you an opportunity and you didn't use it. And this is where you got to be very careful. Now, of course, there's people out there, you know, narcissists and people like that. God doesn't want you in some dysfunctional situation. But if we really dig deep, we know who good people are, don't we? And this is what we're sent here to do. It starts with your children. You know, um, I'm sure that Max's mother is probably really upset right now because she just pretty much her son came to live with me. The person, the one person in his life that she said abandoned him and didn't love him and all these things. And now I get an opportunity to love my son. And I do. I go above and beyond for him. You know, I don't put any pressure on him. Why? Because he had a tough life with his mother. Sorry. Okay, I gotta go, guys. I love you. Take care.